Good morning and welcome to the first of this week's shows. We had a fantastic response to our appeals last week and can bring you some updates on those shortly. Today is another busy one. It certainly is. Later, detectives need your help to find two suspects involved in a serious sexual assault at a train station in Kent. They were just pushing me, both of them pushing me. I was trembling. They took me over the bridge to the platform on the other side. I knew it was serious. We hear how two caregivers who stole nearly £80,000 from an elderly man suffering from dementia were caught. Everybody needs care at some point in their lives. They're there to be looking after that individual and yet they're abusing that position. It's just really distressing to see exactly what is going on behind closed doors. And we've got exclusive figures from a new study on the worrying rise in sextortion among teenagers. We'll be hearing what parents can do to protect their children. All of the officers for today's appeals are with us throughout the programme, along with our team, who are ready to take your calls. You can scan our QR code with your phone's camera, and that will take you through to our homepage, where all of our contact details can be found. The number to call is 08468999. You can also send a WhatsApp message on that same number. You can text us on 63399, start with the word crime, leave a space, then write your message. Or, of course, you can just email us at cwl at bbc.co.uk. First this morning, we wanted to start with a good news story. A police officer who gave chase on a borrowed bike. I joined the police to stop criminals. If I wasn't willing to go to these lengths, they're going to get away. I'm on a bike, I'm in pursuit. My name is Lewis Marks and I'm a police constable. My day-to-day -day role is as a response officer in Northampton Police, so my role is to respond to any incident as and when it comes in, shopliftings, robberies, uh, domestic incidents, neighbourhood disputes, the full range. As police officers, we often do need the help of the public to catch criminals. We can't do our job without them. So this incident took place in Northampton. The gentleman was first seen dealing drugs in a car park. From the description from CCTV, we were able to identify the suspect who is well known to Northampton Police. So we then put in a plan to contain him and detain him for a search. So I selected an alleyway that leads to the car park just in case he was to attempt to flee via that route. Unfortunately, he was able to slip out of that on his bike. So officers were in pursuit of him. They identified that he was heading towards Beckett's Park. It's in move, move. Beckett's Park, Beckett's Park along the canal path. I drove that way. I initially sighted him in Beckett's Park. My colleagues gave chase to who they thought was the suspect on foot. I realised at that point we are never going to catch him. If we're on foot and he's on a bike, it's just not going to happen. If we're not trying to act quickly, the simple fact is he's going to get away. I'd noticed that there was a member of the public close by who was on a bicycle, so I asked him if I could borrow his bike. Hey, borrow your bike! Let me borrow your bike! I then chased him across the park. I think from the point where I first saw him, he was approximately 30 metres away. 594 is going across Beckett's Park towards Bedford Road. He's going left, left, back towards Mickey Frog. I didn't really have a plan to stop him. My plan was to just catch up with him and then play it by ear. It was quite a singular purpose, and that was, I've got to get him. I've got to stop him. I've got to catch him. I am the officer closest to him. I can't let him get away. I'm not really a keen cyclist. I don't own a bike. I haven't cycled for a very long time. I was getting a little bit breathless. I think it's fair to say I'm probably not as fit as I used to be. Luckily, the way the direction he turned in, I was able to cut him off. I saw him approaching. I thought, let's just ram into him and see where we go. I dismounted my bike and pushed it into his rather than hitting him straight on. He fell off, he knocked me to the ground. He was trying to resist my efforts to detain him. Managed to get hold of him, thankfully, get him detained, and then other officers arrived. Uh, 
and I then decided I needed to return that bike to the member of the public so it's not to leave him stranded. I'm going to get this back to its owner. I've just grabbed it off a member of the public. Oh, it's I cycled it back to make sure that it wasn't damaged in the collision, it was riding OK. I found the member of the public. I shook his hand, told him thank you very much. Mate, I caught him. Wouldn't have caught him without your help. Thank you, really appreciate that. Thank All right. You, Cheers. I do wish I'd taken his name. It would have been nice to, to thank him a little bit more formally, really. The suspect was found to have hidden drugs within his body. Within that container was found um, several dozen wraps of both heroin and crack cocaine. The offender, Sean Prosser, was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. I think this incident shows to any other criminals that we are relentless in our pursuit. We are going to take every opportunity we can to detain them, to get them arrested and get them convicted and sent to prison. I wouldn't have been able to detain this person without that member of the public's help. He certainly would have got away. He was definitely a good Samaritan that day. It's uh, really helpful to have members of the public that are willing to step in and make a real difference. Absolutely cracking chase there. Well, if you're the kind person who loaned PC Lewis Marks your bike, please do get in touch as the officer would really like to say thanks. Now it's time for our first appeal. It's a traumatising rape from 2018. Detectives are appealing for your help to find the two men responsible. Just to warn you, as you would expect, this film contains some pretty strong scenes. It was summertime. I remember that it was late, maybe 10.30 or 11. I was on my way to visit a friend. I got off in Batten Ball Station in Sevenoaks. I was the only person that got off the train. As I was walking, there was a man standing there smoking. He started talking to me. He said, hey, young lady, where are you going? I didn't want to answer. I just kept walking. He said, where do you think you're going? I'm going home, I said. Just let me go home. <laughs> then he pulled out a knife and pushed it against me. He said, Walk down there. I'm like, let me go home. He said, I'm not joking with you. Just do whatever I want you to do, otherwise I'll hurt you. I was looking around to see if anybody could help me. I saw a man coming out of a car. I thought that this man with the knife might run away or leave me alone, but when I saw him, he didn't even look scared, nothing, so... I realised that they were together. He came to us and started talking as well. Walk down there, walk there, walk fast. They were just pushing me, both of them, pushing me. I was trembling. They took me over the bridge to the platform on the other side. I knew it was serious. I started crying. They were like, shut your mouth and do what I say. I didn't have any strength. There was nothing I could do. I wanted to keep my life safe. They took me to the shelter on the platform. Then they raped me. It lasted almost half an hour. I didn't want to walk. I wanted to sit down and cry, but they didn't want me to do that. They were just like, walk there, go, 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 walk. 
I had to try with all of my strength to walk. They left me there, so I was just walking on the road, crying. That day, my friend left the key under the doormat for me. Everyone was sleeping. And I was just crying. All night, I couldn't sleep. I wish I could just change my skin. Everything was just there in my mind. I was so ashamed. I thought that everything was my fault. It changes everything in my life, everything. I just wish I could go to bed and stay there forever. Maybe life can change again, but now I don't have any life. There is no one there. Most of the time is just like this, every single day, crying, crying, crying. Just awful. Uh, I'm joined now by temporary detective superintendent Sam Blackburn from the British Transport Police Major at Sirius and Organised Crime Unit. Thanks so much for coming back on the programme, Sam. You were with us actually last week to talk about a different appeal, which we'll catch up on in a moment. But let's talk about this attack first of all. It happened back in 2018. What more can you tell us about what happened? Firstly, you know, what a brave survivor to come forward and talk us through this vile and vicious assault. We have the Battenball Railway Station, 21st of July, 2018. This is a really quiet station. It happened between 10.30 and 11.30 at night. And I'm after specific leads in relation to a VW motor car, polo or a golf, dark blue or black, that may have been in the car park at the time which these two suspects left. Let's talk in a bit more detail about the suspects that, that, that we saw in the film. What else do we know? They're two black males, late 20s, early 30s, back in 2018. Very little is known about one suspect. He's just a black male wearing a black baseball cap and black clothing. And it's the second suspect that I'm really keen on. We've, we've done an, an e-fit of that individual with that brave survivor, and he is very distinctive. I'm not going to go through specific details of him apart from that hair. He's got black red small plaits going up into a man bun and at the tips blonde or dyed blonde or, or light brown and that's quite distinctive and I'm asking for anyone who's, who knows that man with that hair mm. back in 2018 to come forward but more so we've got a tattoo on this guy on his left forearm a scorpion tattoo that may have been in the colours of the Jamaican flag so black gold and green and both these are described as talking with Jamaican accents, albeit they're speaking English. They've got that Jamaican link again. Mm. And again, just really want people to come forward, think around those tattoos, think about that vehicle, think about that hair. You know, yes, it's almost six years ago, but this is still so vitally important to us and this survivor. Absolutely. Have you been able to trace any CCTV or link to any similar offences around the area? We are limited in our conventional inquiries that we can run. That's why we're, we're, we're wanting this EFIT to go as far and wide mm. as possible. Um, we have linked in with the National Crime Agency. Their analysis section has said this is an isolated incident. We can't link it to any other offences in the locality. Just remind us of the car that you mentioned. Yeah, so the vehicle, it's a small VW Polo or Golf, dark blue or black in colour. And that was seen in the car park at the Bat and Ball. So who has access to that vehicle in 2018? Mm. Did you remember lending it to someone? Someone driving that car that matches that EFIT? That's really, really important to us. You know, also asking a wider appeal almost, the tattoo, a tattoo artist. Did you design that? Did you ink that on that left arm? And, you know, the links to Jamaica, you know, the, the colours, black, green and gold, could be vital to us and will help us narrow down our inquiries. 
this is an investigation that could do with some new leads. So you would urge anybody that's watching at home this morning to get in touch, even if it's the smallest piece of information, wouldn't you? Exactly that. Drivers of those vehicles, tattoo artists, family and friends. It's time that these two were brought to justice, most definitely. Absolutely. So if you were at or anywhere near Battenball train station in Sevenoaks, Kent, late on the evening of the 21st of July, that's back in 2018, if you've seen anything suspicious or anyone who may fit this description, please do get in touch with us. All the ways to do that are on the screen below, just next to the clock. People can get in touch with you directly as well, can't they? That's right. They can get through the BTP website, but also through www.mipp.police.uk. And you can see this appeal and all the information around it but also the appeals we did last week yeah as you mentioned you were here last week talking about wanting to identify a number of males that had lost their lives on on the rail network you got some promising calls as a result of being on crime watch didn't you brilliant and this is what i'm asking for this appeal as well those viewers have been fantastic we've had some really positive leads names put forward that we're now checking out with our specialist detectives you know keep those names coming in keep that information coming in really really important it really is Sam thanks again for joining us this morning our next appeal involves a woman who had hundreds of pounds stolen by a deft hand and distraction I'm joined now with Paul Fairhurst PC from Cheshire Police uh, thank you for coming in Paul um, so this offence is only a matter of weeks old it involved a vulnerable lady who was at a cash machine just on the 24th of February and then she was duped into having her money stolen we can see on CCTV the crime taking place talk us through what happened OK, so it's um, Saturday the 24th of um, February this year. Um, the lady is in the pink coat in the middle. She's at the cash machine at the Halifax. And there's a gentleman behind who we believe is um, watching her put a pin number in. And at the moment, she's being spoken to the male at the next machine, who's the one that carries out the distraction. OK, now she's there thinking she's getting a statement, but they're telling her something's apparently wrong with the machine. That's correct. And at this point, he's actually got hold of her cash card from her machine. He's pressed something and he's managed to uh, retrieve her card, which is now using in the machine next to her. To take out a substantial amount of cash? Yes. It How withdraws, much? It withdraws £400 from her account uh, in a second, which she'll get hold of shortly. And this lady still thinks there's a problem with the machine. She has no idea that her money is being stolen literally in front of her. And she goes inside to the branch here. Now, that was very quick, Paul. So what yep. I'm going to do, let's play that again. And I urge viewers just to keep an eye on the person in the dark coloured clothing. And he's got something in his hand there. We can see that white paper sort of obscuring what's going on. And yes. there, it's with the sleight of hand. Watch now, he's going to put a card into his ATM and you... And you believe that is actually her card? That's her card, yes. Yeah, so he's taken yeah. her card, put it in, and taken out £400. And sadly, that wasn't even the end of what occurred that day. No, it wasn't. Uh, so shortly on from this, he'll get the £400 which he puts in his pocket. Uh, his opposite number is still keeping an eye out for the lady. So on the um, other side of the screen there, you can see another person in dark clothing. You believe they're absolutely working together on this, sharing information. They then go to another... ATM. Yes, he stays and speaks to this lady and advises to go into the, um, the branch to report it stolen and the second deal cross directly across the road to the TSB branch on the opposite side where he repeats the same procedure. So we know he's got her PIN number, we know he's got a card and he withdraws another £400. This is interesting here, Paul. What happens here? So this is the uh, second mail and he's indicating to the woman that, oh, the card's not working. So trying and, and to make it look that they're just two pe helpful people trying to say that machine's not working, all part of the act yes, that they've used here absolutely. in order to steal this poor, vulnerable lady's money. Now, they are slick with how they've done this. We had to play that twice to yes. show everyone just what they've done, but you think they may well have done this before? Absolutely. The, the way that they work together, the communication between them and the fact that it's so fast, I'm convinced that they've done this before and will continue to do so. Well, let's have a look at them. This is the, the image of the two people you'd like to speak to. What can you give us in terms of their so description? So, both um, black males. Um, the one on the left, unfortunately, is... He was wearing a very shiny uh, black jacket, but unfortunately, because he's got his ears down or the, on the flaps of his hood... You can just see that there. Yeah, yeah. it was quite hard to make out. Uh, but he has got a, what looks like a wedding ring uh, on his hand. Mm -hmm. The gentleman on the right was much bigger, uh, well over six foot, uh, very broad build. Uh, this is a clearer image. And he's got a beard and glasses. So what we're asking, if people were in the Warrington Town Centre on that day and saw them, if they seen them get into a vehicle or on a train, if they could get in contact. Mm -hmm. Equally, we believe that these people have committed offences elsewhere. Um, 
probably in the Manchester area. So if there's neighbouring forces that can identify them, we'd urge that other officers contact ourselves. And this was just weeks ago, so 24th of February. Broad daylight, a busy Saturday, but as you say, they could have travelled elsewhere. So you want to hear from anyone that recognises these people because they may well have done it before. Absolutely. Now, Paul, we know this lady is, is vulnerable. Um, how is she doing now? How has this affected her? It's affected her in terms of she's a lot more wary when she goes out. She's now actually changed her sort of her habits. So mm -hmm. she doesn't go out in the afternoon anymore. She now goes out earlier. Um, she no longer feels safe at the cash machine. She just goes inside the branch uh, and it's left her shaken up and obviously upset. It's completely understandable, but that in itself is probably good advice, Paul, isn't it? If you've got the option to go inside to a branch and use an ATM, that's, that's going yeah, to be good advice. What I would say to people, absolutely. Uh, I know that not every branch is open at the right time. Not everybody has the opportunity, but just be wary um, mm. of what's around you. Don't be distracted. If you're going to the cash machine, just don't let somebody distract you from what you're doing position yourself so you cover your pin numbers up so people can't see your, your numbers going in uh, and, if and someone can't... who thinks that acts like they're trying to help may be doing the opposite absolutely yeah, yeah. great advice so have a good look at these two if you know them or something similar has happened to you do get in touch next how to council workers abuse their position of trust to defraud a dementia patient out of tens of thousands of pounds Everybody needs care at some point in their lives. They're there to be looking after that individual, and yet they're abusing that position. It's just really distressing to see um, exactly what is going on behind closed doors. Across England and Wales, there are teams of specialist police officers whose job it is to investigate cases of abuse against vulnerable people who receive care. DI Allison Street manages the unit which covers the West Midlands. The main types of abuse that we deal with on our team are physical abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, neglect and death. Very frequently people are actually overlooked if they're either disabled or they're mentally unwell. And it's really important that my team give those people a voice to try to get them just as if we can. One such case involved 85-year-old John Addison from Wolverhampton. A hard-working man, he'd spent much of his life serving his country in the Navy. John was a gentleman, uh, a lovely, quiet, unassuming man. He loved to talk uh, about his naval career and, and about his childhood. He was also a fan of shiny shoes, and I'm, I'm assuming that came from his naval days. So he had his own shoe kit in his room, and if your shoes weren't up to scratch, he'd offer to polish them for you. John lived alone. So when he showed signs of dementia, he needed help. He had no next of kin, he had no family, uh, so he was quite isolated and alone. A member of the council, Joanne Lewis, visited John to talk about an overgrown tree in his garden. She noticed that he had some vulnerabilities and therefore referred into the neighbourhood support office to um, somebody who happened to be her friend, who was a lady called Karen Corr. Karen attended the address and she agreed that a package of care would be, would be put in place to support him. Karen Corr and Joanne Lewis ended up managing John's care themselves, offering support with his cleaning shopping and finances. But two years later, when John was admitted into a care home because of his ailing health, suspicions were raised about the two women's conduct. He was admitted there by two people, both of whom were actually purporting to be John's nieces, but actually, in fact, they were Karen Corr and Joanne Lewis who um, he, he said that would be looking after him and responsible for his uh, finances. Immediately, obviously, alarm bells started ringing. The case was passed to the adult care abuse team, who began by looking at John's medical records. They quickly discovered a do not resuscitate order had been taken out on John's behalf, asking doctors not to take action if his heart or breathing stopped. It had been requested by his carers Karen Corr and Joanne Lewis. That decision would normally stand with a doctor and a next of kin. But obviously it does actually beg questions as to why somebody would actually want someone to die, um, unless it was for, for something for their own gain. 
by now suspicious of Karen Corr and Joanne Lewis's role in John's affairs, investigators began looking into his financial arrangements. They were alarmed to discover documents suggesting that he had granted the two women legal control over his entire life savings. Under no circumstances should a carer have power of attorney. It's a complete conflict of interests and it should never have ever happened. Investigators then tried to establish whether any of John's money was missing. He'd worked really hard throughout his life and managed to save a lot of money. Um, and he had over £180,000 in his uh, savings. They soon found suspicious cash withdrawals from his bank account at times when he was incapable of using a cash machine. In the six weeks that he was in hospital, £2,300 was taken out via an ATM machine. When detectives cross-checked the withdrawals with accounts belonging to Karen Corr and Joanne Lewis, their suspicions were confirmed. We were able to establish quite quickly that uh, money going out of John's account was going into their account pretty much at the same time. Investigators also found evidence suggesting someone had been tampering with cheques made out in John's name. We were able to also establish that John was signing cheques, but obviously the amount was in a different writing. And clearly, the only two people that it was made payable to was Karen Corr and Joanne Lewis. Detectives also found evidence that the women had used their power of attorney to take money from his savings. The majority of John's savings was actually in a savings account where normally you'd have to make an appointment to go and speak to somebody to actually withdraw the money out, which, whilst they now had become a lasting power of attorney as well and had access to his bank cards and PIN illegitimately, they were able to take money out without any question. Investigators then began examining John's will and were horrified by what they found. So here in my hand, I actually have a letter to the solicitors from, from John, not written in John's handwriting. Dear sirs, I would like to make amendments to my existing will and leave everything to be divided between Joanne Lewis and Karen Corr. So Karen Corr and Joanne Lewis stood to, to gain an awful lot from his death. Both were arrested and their phones seized. It was quite shocking, really, when we actually read some of the um, text messages between them. At one point, um, Joanne said to Karen, and this was on the day that they'd, they'd withdrawn £374.11p from the post office, uh, big money, and the response was whoop, whoop. And even more tragically, when he was in hospital and really fighting for his life, Karen called a message to, to uh, Joanne Lewis and said, I don't think he will be here now long, bless him. To which she replied, yeah, we need to get some money out now somehow before the inevitable. It's just, it's just so kind of cold and calculating and they had no kind of regard at all for him. In total, over a two year period, the women had stolen 80,000 pounds from John and stood to gain another 100,000 from his will. What these ladies did to him, it's shocking and upsetting, you know, when you've worked hard all your life. Um, nobody deserves that. Karen Corr and Joanne Lewis both pleaded guilty to conspiracy to defraud by abuse of position and were each sentenced to three years and two months in prison. It's been a long process to get justice for John, finally. It means the world to us, it really does. I'm really thankful to the officers for the work that they did on John's case. For some people like John, who don't have a voice to speak out for themselves, we have to be that voice. John's dementia meant that he never knew that he'd been a victim of such a terrible abuse of trust. He died at Waterside Care Home in Wolverhampton, surrounded by people who really did care for him. I actually took John's service myself, and it was a privilege and an honor to be able to do that last thing for him. We gave him a good send-off, uh, a fitting send-off for a fitting and good man. 
really is an upsetting film, but it's clear how caring and compassionate those officers were. And I'm joined by one of them right now, D.I. Alison Street, who runs a unit you've just seen in the film there. Thanks for coming in, Alison. I mean, this really is a serious crime, care abuse, but it's also one that seems to be underreported a lot of the time. Absolutely, Rav, it really is. And, it, and I feel really privileged and proud to be able to head my team in West Midlands Police. In all our cases, our victims have got are adults with care and support needs. And our youngest victim at the moment is just over 18. Our oldest is 103. And all our victims are victims of physical, physical abuse, sexual, financial abuse, neglect, and even death by people who should be actually looking after them. Our victims tend to have Alzheimer's, dementia, profound learning disabilities, and as they sometimes have died. So it's really important that the team actually try to give them a voice and get justice where we can. I know you're so passionate yeah. about this, Alice, and I can hear it in, yeah. your, in your voice there. And I know there's going to be people watching this now that have got loved ones in care. Should they be worried? They shouldn't be worried per se, and I don't want to kind of scaremonger anybody because there's some amazing people out there who do fantastic care. You know, the whole term carers, that's it, that's what they're called, they're meant to care. There are just a few bad pennies in that particular industry, and obviously we need to look out for those, and those are the ones we're looking out for. OK, so what are the signs that people could look out for that, that maybe they're not being cared for in the way that they believe they were? There's no one size fits all. However, I would say if you have, for example, a, phys um, a victim, a, your, one of your loved ones, suddenly has been very, used to be very tactile mm -hmm. and open, and suddenly withdraws, maybe they might be a victim of a sexual abuse or a physical abuse. If they start to get sort of unexplained bruises and injuries, you might want to check the care records to see exactly what's been reported and whether or not there are any concerns. And if there's nothing been reported, you, I, I would ask questions about how they've sustained those injuries. If somebody's bed bound, for example, and they get fractured bones, how's that happened? Mm -hmm. Or if you've got somebody who doesn't leave their premises and you check your bank balance and actually see that they've gone through a drive-in McDonald's, for example, or they've purchased items on the internet and they actually haven't got any knowledge about how to use the internet, that would raise awareness, um, alarm bells. And certainly from my point of view, if you have a kind of a, de a death, somebody dies and actually it was completely unexpected, you had no, con no understanding about why, I would certainly be looking at that cause of death. So that's really interesting what you say there because it's not necessarily about the amount that's been taken now it could be even small small purchases but if that's out of character for them that could be something you look into Absolutely. so if you need to report this mm -hmm. where where can you turn where where who needs to know about this I sort of thing i think you need to report it you know first of all i would say for relatives to document any okay. concerns they've got so that's a good audit trail yeah. for us and that will assist us in an investigation but also on top of that i think reporting it to third sector third party uh, agencies sort of like social services okay. West, uh, the, the, the police, I say in my case West Midlands, but the police in general. Yeah. Uh, if it's a concern around a death, then I would say the coroner's officers, but you need to just be reporting to agencies. Yeah, really, really important there. And as you say, it's just giving these people a voice and looking out for them. The signs could be subtle, as you say. It might not be physical, but look for these signs and look after them. All Absolutely. right, Alison, thank you so much for joining us thank today. Thank you. Michelle. Now, sextortion is a crime that we've talked about on the programme before, but today we've been given exclusive figures that show a terrifying rise in crimes against teenage boys. I'm joined now by Susie Hargreaves from the Internet Watch Foundation and Amy Beaumont from Childline. Thanks so much to both of you for, for coming in uh, this morning and, and telling us more. Before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of the, the figures, it'd be good to know a bit more, Susie, about what the Internet Watch Foundation does. Well, thank you, Michelle. Yes, the Internet Watch Foundation, the IWF, is the UK hotline for reporting and removing online child sexual abuse. We work with law enforcement and uh, NGOs like NSPCC and also, importantly, the internet industry to do whatever we can to take these images off the internet. So we provide technical services to disrupt the distribution of child sexual abuse images. Which is just fantastic and, and so important. Just remind us exactly what sextortion is, though. Well, sextortion is sexually coerced extortion. In fact, it's a type of very nasty blackmail where a young person will be tricked into sharing a naked image of themselves and then taken down a blackmail route. It's, it's scary, isn't it? Mm. And worryingly, as we mentioned at the top there, these figures are, are on the rise, aren't they? Yes, they are, I'm afraid, Michelle. So two years ago, we had six reports from young people of sextortion. Last year, we had 176. And they are coming from young men. Mm -hmm. So we are particularly concerned about the sort of 16 to 17-year-old young men. 91% of their reports were from young men. And 23% of all the reports we received of sextortion were the most severe types of abuse. 
Yeah, these are serious figures that we're talking about here. Now, I guess the good news is that you've got a really effective tool, the Report and Remove tool. Tell us more about that. Yes, Report Remove was a tool that we created with the NSPCC and it enables young people to self-refer an image of themselves where we can assess it and then take it down. And importantly, we're able to do that without them being worried about being criminalised in the process. Mm. So if they have shared an image or if they have been uh, tricked into it in some way, we want them not to despair, they're victims, and then they can use the report remove tool and we'll do everything we can to get that image taken off the internet. It's so important that they remember that they are victims, mm. you know, that that's, that's a key thing, a key message to get across. Amy, before we talk a bit more about the work that, that you do with NSPCC, I think it'd be really good to just get behind the minds of the, the MO behind the, the criminals, because they are highly organised criminals, aren't they? And they have a certain pattern, a certain formula that they use. We've got some examples mm -hmm. here that, that we can take a look at, Susie. Um, what have we got here then? Well, this is a very typical chat log. So criminals, they will kind of uh, cast the net wide. They will try and approach hundreds of young people and a couple of those will land. So basically a young person will think they're talking to, a particular young man will think they're talking to a, a, a glamorous woman who's saying you're cute, want to share your images. Mm. And very quickly, if they share a naked image, they will be taken down this blackmail route. And you can see how the, the nature of the messaging just starts to change. It gets quite threatening, doesn't it? It's really nasty. And these, and I just think we just have to remember these are young people, they're vulnerable, they are victims, and the perpetrators are extremely devious and clever. Mm. So we need to protect our young people at all costs. And these criminals, they're sending messages to hundreds of hundreds, people, aren't they? Yeah, and hundreds, because it's about money for them. Yeah. And if one of them will land, they'll get that young person into that downward spiral of of paying them mm. to not have their images shared that is and we want thing. to give those young people some hope and thankfully on the internet watch foundation there's there's a helpful guide isn't there that you can go on the website and actually find some more information that could absolutely. be absolutely iwf.org.uk type in sextortion there's a guide for parents carers and young people um, Amy, just coming to you, for, for any young person that's going through this, it must be absolutely terrifying. And I'm sure you have seen that, you've heard that firsthand from, from the accounts of the victims that, that you speak to. Yeah, the impact on young people is just massive, where they will talk to us about how it's had an impact on their mental health, kind mm. of caused feelings of, kind of isolation, anxiety, depression. A young person may be worried every time their phone goes off for fear of another message coming through the worry of somebody finding out, getting in trouble, especially if they've taken money from their parents to pay the abusers. And even it can lead to things like self-harm or suicidal feelings mm. of not knowing a way out of this. Of course, so mm. just the impact can be really far reaching, can't it? We've actually got a statement from, yeah. from one of the victims that I'd, I'd like to read out. Um, he's explained how, how the crime made them feel. He said, um, if I didn't send one more, he would share my photo. This is what the victim's saying. It was never just one more. He turned nasty and used abusive language. I became completely isolated and lived in constant fear. I ended up calling Childline and they helped me find a way forward com uh, completely confidentially. Um, harrowing just to, to read that, Amy, but also, just good to hear that there's some reassurance from the work that you're doing. Yeah, and Childline is kind of the UK's free confidential helpline for young people up to the age of 19. Kind of a variety of ways they can contact us, whether it's on the phone on 0800 1111 or on one-to-one -one chats or emails on the Childline website. And what we do is give young people that safe, confidential space to first of all talk about what's happened, how this situation has come about, explore kind of the feelings and the impact it's had on them but then also look to see what options they have who they could talk to whether it's a trusted adult whether it's the police or even use the information on the Childline website kind of we've got information about the report remove tool on mm -hmm. our online and mobile safety pages where they can make those reports then themselves. Yeah, having that safe space to talk about it is, mm. is key. And just finally, what advice would you give parents when they're engaging with their children or other young people mm. about this? So one of the first things we really want to encourage is to start from kind of that preventative side of having open and honest conversations with our children around what the risks are of using the online world, how to stay safe, how to kind of think about who they may be talking to. 
but then also if something does happen give their child that kind of calm reassuring space to tell them what's happened without putting any blame on them and then look at how we can then tell somebody else really good advice amy susie thank you so much thank for coming you. in and telling thank us you. more this morning really appreciate it Raf. Now it's that time in the programme where we appeal for your help in finding suspects who are wanted by police forces up and down the country. First, we have Jeeva Karen Ramanathan, who also goes by the name Jeeva. Thames Valley Police want to speak with him in connection to a number of fraud offences that total over £90,000. He's 45 of South Asian heritage with a heavy beard, although this may have changed, and thick black hair. He's believed to have connections in North and South Harrow and in Wembley in London. Or what about John Eric Wells, otherwise known as Howard Hemmings? South Yorkshire Police want to speak with a 66-year-old in relation to three counts of serious romance fraud. Wells has links to Doncaster and South Yorkshire. Well, this here is Josh or Joshua Avis, but he also uses the surnames Spring, Porter and Peverell. Greater Manchester Police have charged him with conspiracy to import and distribute Class A drugs and conspiracy to money launder, but he's since gone to ground. He's 38, originally from Liverpool, but police say he has links across the whole of the northwest of England. But they say he may have left the country. And last for today, anyways, Elijah Roden. Hertfordshire Police have charged him with possession to supply cocaine and heroin. He's 31, stocky with a full beard. And he's known to have links to St Albans in Hertfordshire and to Enfield in London. If you recognise any of these men or spot them out and about, please do give us a call. The number is 08000 468 999. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget you can watch any episodes that you might have missed on iPlayer for the next seven days. And if you've been affected by any of the issues covered in today's programme, help and support is available at BBC Action Line and head to our website for further links to support groups if you have been the victim of a crime. Tomorrow, how a team of detectives uncovered the largest prison smuggling operation the UK has ever seen. What started off as an investigation into one member of staff resulted in us uncovering the largest prison conspiracy in the UK. Oh, it looks good, doesn't it? It's it, a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. We'll see you tomorrow at the same time of 9.30. Bye for now. Bye.